Okay, I'm getting ready for my next video. Right, so I'm doing my hair up. I'm gonna put some makeup on. And now, how does that look? Well, but I'm just getting there. Okay, that's preparation for a video. I'm going to read a very cool excerpt from Henry Miller's Maxis. And uh, stay tuned, but I have to eat first. How often, after a heart-rending scene, I felt obliged to walk over the bridge, to collect myself. How unnerving, how shattering it was to be considered an all-powerful being. How ironic and absurd, too, that in the performance of my routine duties, I should be obliged to play the role of a little Christ. Halfway across the span, I would stop and lean over the rail. The sight of the dark, oily waters below comforted me. Into the rushing stream, I emptied my turbulent thoughts and emotions. Still more soothing and fascinating to my spirit were the colored reflections which danced over the surface of the water below. They danced like festive lanterns swaying in the wind. They mocked my somber thoughts and illuminated the deep chasms of misery which yawned within me. Suspended high above the river's flow, I had the feeling of being detached from all problems, relieved of all cares and responsibilities. Never once did the river stop to ponder or question. Never once did it seek to alter its course. Always onward, onward, full and steady. Looking back towards the shore, how like toy blocks appeared the skyscrapers which overshadowed the river's bank. How ephemeral, how puny, how vain and arrogant. Into these grandiose tombs, men and women muscle their way day in and day out, killing their souls to earn their bread, selling themselves, selling one another, even selling God some of them. And towards night they poured out again like ants, choked the gutters, dove into the underground, or scampered homeward pitter-patter to bury themselves again not in grandiose tombs now, but like the worn, haggard, defeated wretches they were, in shacks and rabbit warrens which they called home, by day the graveyard of senseless sweat and toil, by night the cemetery of love and despair. And these creatures who had so faithfully learned to run, to beg, to sell themselves and their fellow men, to dance like bears or perform like trained poodles, ever and always belying their own nature. These same wretched creatures broke down now and then. They wept like fountains of misery, crawled like snakes, uttered sounds which only wounded animals are thought to emit. What they meant to convey by these horrible antics was that they had come to the end of the rope, that the powers above had deserted them, that unless someone spoke to them, someone who understood their language of distress, they were forever lost, broken, betrayed. Someone had to respond, someone recognizable, someone so utterly inconspicuous that even a worm would not hesitate to lick his boots. And I was that kind of worm, 
the perfect warm. Defeated in the place of love, equipped not to do battle, but to suffer insult and injury, it was I who had been chosen to act as comforter. What a mockery that I who had been condemned and cast out, I who was unfit and altogether devoid of ambition, should be allotted the judge's seat, made to punish and reward to act the father, the priest, the benefactor, or the executioner. I, who had trotted up and down the land, always under the sting of the lash. I, who could take the Woolworth stairs at a gallop, if it was to bum a free lunch. I, who had learned to dance to any tune, to pretend all abilities, all capabilities. I, who had taken so many kicks in the pants only to return for more. I, who understood nothing of the crazy setup, except that it was wrong, sinful, insane. I, now, of all men, I was summoned to dispense wisdom love and understanding. God himself could not have picked a better goat. Only a despised and lonely member of society could qualify for such delicate role. Ambition did I say that a moment ago? Oh yes, the ambition to save what I could from the wreck. To do for these poor wretches what had not been done for me. To breathe an ounce of spirit into their deflated souls. To set them free from bondage honor them as human beings, make them my friends. And while these thoughts, as of another life, were crowding my head, I could not help but compare that situation, so difficult as it then seemed, with the present one. Then my words had weight, my counsels were listened to. Now nothing I said or did carried the least weight. I had become the full incarnate. Whatever I attempted, whatever I proposed, fell to dust. Even were I to writhe on the floor protestingly, or foam at the mouth like an epileptic, it would be to no avail. I was but a dog baying at the moon.